going to start panel number seven, which is under the title Preservation of Traditional Architecture, part one. Um, most of our presenters on this session will be all based in Qatar. So the first one would be Maria Al Hamadi from the University of Qatar. And she'll be talking about traditional architecture and, her and the heritage industry in the Gulf, followed by uh, Jamal Boussa from the uh, Qatar University as well on resilient historic centers in the Gulf, cultural heritage, urban regeneration and sustainability. And that would be followed by Raffaello uh, Furlan, also from the Qatar University, on the Souk Waqaf Heritage Site in Doha, special form and livability. And finally, by Ali Al Aruf from Urban Planning Authority, and he'll be talking about Gulf architectural heritage from documentation to rehabilitation, uh, contesting the fake and the authentic. And I would ask everyone if they can kindly introduce themselves briefly and then move to present your topics. And everyone should maintain their time up maximum of 20 minutes, please. Okay? Thank you. Uh. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Maryam Al Hamadi. I'm from Qatar University, from a humanity department. Actually, my specialty is museums and culture studies. I'm not an architect. However, I'm, I'm, I look at uh, uh, traditional architecture from uh, a preservation and conservation perspective. Uh, so I will talk today about it. The, my paper is not about uh, uh, also culture and heritage. It's uh, rather about the way the government in Qatar imposes uh, meaning upon Qatari culture and uh, heritage and is about uh, the way uh, they uh, subsumed this heritage into certain interpretation and uh, reading. Uh, we can notice that from the beginning of 1970s uh, to the middle of uh, 90, to the mid of 1990s, exactly during the reign of Sheikh Khalifa bin Hamad uh, Al Thani, a traditional Qatar architecture. <laughs> Uh, had been subject to compulsory demolition in order to build uh, new cities and uh, sites. Uh, there were a very small number of uh, sites and uh, traditional architecture. Uh, they were uh, preserved into uh, museums. Um, and this wasn't the case only in Qatar, actually. This was the case in most of Arabian Gulf countries, because at, during that time, uh, Arabian Gulf countries in general, they were under uh, development and urbanization plans. Uh, uh, in 1980s and early 1990s, for example, uh, many aspects of Qatar's organic past has been destroyed. The Qatari experience uh, prior to, uh, to 1995 witnessed a move towards a concept of itself that was uh, dominated by the new. Uh, uh, as I said, this wasn't uh, only the case in, in Qatar, but it was also a similar case uh, running on in the Arabian Gulf. There, uh, uh, so there was a, a, a question uh, about uh, what's happening in the Gulf at this uh, time, uh, which is about whether or not we could have saved examples of a traditional architecture during the development of process and if so, how could we have saved them? Uh, unfortunately, these low adult buildings, which occupied a great area of land, sometimes in the center of cities, um, uh, uh, in the center of cities were seen as obstacles in the development process of the Arabian Gulf region. Added to that, the lack of awareness among the communities of the value and worth of this architectural inheritance facilitated the government's uh, demolition plans. Uh, whole towns and cities were abandoned, with many uh, treasures of a traditional architecture uh, demolished. These buildings were replaced with a new building Buildings, such as in the figures here during the uh, 1980s until the beginning of 1990s. <clears throat> Uh, it may have been viewed by the government at that time that adapting Western style was a way of keeping up with international development. 
Uh, however, in 1995, when Sheikh Khalif, uh, when Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa took over the rule in Qatar, he provided uh, a glimmer of hope for this cultural inheritance in his development plans. His attempt to modernize the statement, balancing demands for a new office buildings, a trade quarters, uh, ministry buildings, and vertical residential buildings with the need to protect the irreplaceable national architectural inheritance. This is why he began his preservation plan with Sugwagif, the traditional Qatari architecture uh, market, which had been restored in a modern style quite different uh, from a traditional Qatari architecture during the reign of his predecessor, Sheikh Khalifa. Since 1995, and as a compensation for the lost heritage, there has been a, driven, uh, a drive in Qatar to, re uh, to recreate places that reflect Qatar's organic past. In addition to this, the government developed Sugwagif Hotel. Uh, these the uh, uh, some of, uh, some parts of Sugwagif were restored to the to its, its uh, original. Um, uh, architecture building, uh, and this is the Sugwagif, which developed also during Sheikh Hamad uh, era, which uh, located at the heart of Sugwagif. This illustrates the intention of the government of turning the Sug into a Qatari landmark and tourist destination. Uh, of universal interest, heritage appears as an image of history, uh, rather than a place or building that possesses a history. Accordingly, uh, the interest in the preserving and the presenting heritage has become the domain of a specific group of people, those at the top of the social hierarchy in Qatar. They choose what is worthy of preservation, uh, display, and remembrance. What is interesting uh, here is the replication of Sugwagif and what is uh, what it represents as a Qatari national heritage. Uh, a strong economy in Qatar at that time has allowed the government to, be, to blend direct and indirect policies in the replication of a site in which they could engineer um, uh, a state of mind uh, to modify public attitudes toward national culture. The government is framed as a responsible protector of national heritage, while simultaneously it takes control of an important part of population's history and memory. That in its turn preserves the idea of a pure national identity. Replic replicating the Sug in its original form it creates an attractive destination for foreign tourists where they can appreciate and experience original Qatari heritage as it was assumed. Uh, the Sug is the government's creation of a gigantic simulacrum, which is supposed to provide a tourist with a sense of reality of Qatar in the past. The boom in construction has provoked the need for Qatari people to find an icon where they can demonstrate the strength of the country's identity and show that their heritage has not been undermined during this development process. Therefore, the nation can look onward for a strength through its, uh, its own identity. There is no doubt that the traditional architecture can provide a sample of essence of Qatari heritage, particularly at a time when many designer skyscrapers are spreading along Doha Corniche. Uh, it acts to present uh, the leader's attempts to blend the past with the present, to create a space for history in everyday contemporary life. This function of the site is apparent in the politician's insistence on arranging a tour for uh, formal visitors uh, to Sugwagif, such as uh, arranging uh, in 2007, arranging a tour for uh, Prince Charles, who visited uh, Doha in five days, uh, 2007, and he was accompan uh, accompanied by Sheikh Al Mayasa, the daughter of she the. Uh, uh, Father Amir at that time. The, the prince rested at, uh, at the traditional uh, Qatari cafe with its traditional uh, furniture and had uh, and experienced the traditional tea and food uh, at Sugwagif. 
the image of this visit in the press demonstrate the ambition to restore the majority of the souks building as a traditional Kateri cafe uh, and a traditional Kateri grocery, a traditional shop selling Kateri women's products, even the Iranian uh, carriers uh, and policemen in the traditional uniform, uh, 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 they all uh, made a present at the souk. Uh, however, beside these direct and indirect policies, Sugwag represents an implicate fear of permanent loss. There is a, a fear of losing Qatari uh, heritage and identity. During Sheikh Hamad's region, there has been an expansion in the conception of heritage. Uh, the great number of immigrants in Qatar in relation to the population of indigenous people has without doubt increased uh, the tendency for nostalgia. In Qatar, the revolution started with a change in the uh, demographic structure. The population in Qatar has grown sharply. This occurred when the government allowed the investment of foreign capital and encouraged immigration. Nonetheless, the development of a traditional Qatari architecture in both Zugwagif Doha and Zugwagif al Wakra later on as a cultural heritage tool is aimed at, uh, at presenting a history for Qatar as it continues uh, to operate despite demogra uh, demographic differences by uh, promoting the hegemony of identity. The social revolution has led to evolution with all its consequences for heritage and a culture. We are dealing here with a relationship between heritage uh, and identity, a strategy that the political leaders use to provide a sense of a meaning when accommodating a Qatari heritage within the market context in Sugwagif with its traditional architecture. The successful experience of preserving a sense of Qatari traditional architecture in Sugwagif Doha projects encouraged the further Amir Sheikh Hamad to commission another scheme to restore a part of the old uh, coastal city, Al Wakra, where another traditional architecture building was developed to eventually provide another traditional tourist site for Qatar. To conclude this paper, we can, uh, we can say that Qatari government formed plans which are attempting to link the culture and economic, uh, economic sector through the presentation of a traditional Qatari architecture. This is one reason uh, why today uh, Qatar focuses so much on reconstructing its cultural heritage and preserving more Qatari architecture such as what we see today in Mishirab. Uh, Qatari heritage became no longer a self-referential heritage, rather it is simulated heritage that wished to present Qatar on the world map. The government is using heritage as a reflection of historical facts and as an instrument in the hope of finding a sense of reality in objects that could become representative of Qatari history. Thank you very much. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thanks for the chairs. Thanks for uh, Dr. James for organizing this uh, prominent event. And thanks for my, uh, our senior students from Qatar University and the audience who are with us today. Just a brief uh, presentation. My name is Jamal Boussa. I am an assistant professor at Qatar University. I did my PhD with a prominent professor. He is uh, with us today, uh, Professor Showman. Uh, he, he was an inspiration for me to direct my research during the last 20 years in issues related to urban heritage in the Middle East and North Africa. <laughs> yeah. uh, I will be talking about, uh, I think I am, uh, I am going to present between two presentations, the, the, uh, the former and uh, the, the next one, which will be talking about Souq Waqaf. So uh, I will try to brief and avoid talking too much about Souq Waqaf and broaden the gap and, and go get out of Qatar and see the urban heritage in the Gulf area. I will be talking about the historic centers, uh, their issues today, the remaining historic centers within the global world of today, 
Uh, as you know, the Gulf and the essence of this uh, of this uh, conference is about the Gulf has got a rich cultural heritage. I mean, in all uh, Gulf cities, here, for example, we have the historic city of Nezwa, which has become one of the major tourist attractions in Oman. Qala'at uh, al-Bahrain is uh, one of the first World Heritage Sites in Bahrain in 2005. So the importance of the Gulf her Heritage that recently uh, UNESCO started to inscribe a number of sites on, her world, uh, on the World Heritage List. This is the, uh, the Zubara site, which is, about, uh, which is on the, the north of uh, Qatar. And uh, it has been added to the World Heritage List in 2003, which is the Azubara site, including the fort of Azubara. Uh, values of the urban heritage. I wouldn't uh, comment to uh, one of the most important values is the economic. And as somebody was talking today, I think uh, Professor Nader Ardalan about everything is becoming a dollar. How much is it? So economy is very important, symbolic. It represents the cultural identity of the country, of the city, of the people living there. The political sometimes is uh, using the cultural heritage uh, as uh, a symbol for a national pride and so on. Scientific, it gives the possibility for people, for researchers, to know how people used to live in the past and what kind of means they have used. Historic, it relates a period of time and aesthetic of course, uh, it gives, I mean, an aesthetic emotional experience for the viewer going to the city. A number of cities in the Gulf, this is the city of Doha in 1947, which is just two years before the beginning of exporting oil. The oil was discovered in 1939. It took about 10 years to export it due some political issues and some instability with, with the surrounding countries. This is the view of Manama in the early 1980s, and th there have been a huge development which has been, con uh, I mean, modified extensively the city of Manama. This is the Farij al Fahidi. Farij al Fahidi is a new name for Farij al Bastakia for political reasons as well, uh, because uh, Bastakia is, uh, to, uh, I mean, the, uh, the origin is from uh, the people who live in Bastakia came uh, at the beginning of the 20th century from the south of Iran in the village called Bastak. This is Al Mareja as well. I think there is a major uh, work which is undertaking uh, in Al Mareja area and the surrounding Al Bank Street. And this is one of the unique uh, wind circular wind towers in the Gulf. Most of them, they are square. And the people of Sharjah, they are very proud of this. And they all claim that nobody has got this wind tower apart from the city of Kashan in, uh, uh, in the south of Iran as well. Resilient historic centers, I mean, how this, uh, what are we facing now? We are facing in the Gulf that the remaining historic centers, they are, I mean, under, uh, uh, under pressure of rapid growth and rapid urbanization. And most of them, they have been replaced by high rise buildings. Uh, and this situation, I mean, raises a number of questions. What should be the future of this historic center? Should we knock them down and that's it? Or will they be demolished to pave way for more ambitious growth? Or can, be, can they be sustained for the future generation? Will the historic city, the heart of urban life and the main protector of culture in the Gulf survive and maintain its place? in the city of today and tomorrow? This is a very important question because what are we uh, going to do? And I think one of the objective of this conference is try to at least document what is left before it's too late. Impact of rapid growth, uh, you can see here, for example, this is a Ras area in Dubai, Dira, in 1950, and what's happening today, and the major, I mean, changes that happen, and the major demolition that happened. This is El Bastaki in 1970s, and here half of it has been demolished. And this is the impact of urban growth. This is the city of Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. And uh, for your information, the city of Jeddah, or El Balad, what is the first historic city in the Gulf. It has been inscribed to the UNESCO in 2014. Uh, the impact of the surrounding and uh, uh, strengthening and 
uh, enclosing the remaining historic centers between high-rise buildings around. This is Farij al in uh, Doha, Qatar. This is the surrounding high-rise building in the Mereja area in Sharjah. And the knocking down and of the, uh, the Barjil or the wind tower houses in Dubai and replacing that by high-rise building. This is the first high-rise building that was built in 1979 in Dubai. While, I mean, out of 3,000 historic buildings, 10% uh, only are remaining. This is one of the major Shindara areas in Dubai, which has been completely demolished for 1990, uh, uh, during the 1990s to develop the area with high-rise buildings. And thank God for the visit of uh, uh, Prince Charles, who uh, advised them not to go for that one, but instead it was too late, so they had to reconstruct a new uh, historic area in Shandar. Uh, this is one of the major issues of the remaining historic district, and they are becoming a shelter, a refuge for the low-income people. And this is, uh, uh, this is in Haragin, Bahrain, a number of historic buildings, like it's happening in different parts of uh, the Gulf. They are becoming shelter because these houses, they are mainly in the city center, near the city. They are approximate. They don't need a car. They don't need a taxi. They can walk around, and at the same time, they Sometimes they are leaving it without paying any, uh, any money, and sometimes they pay just very little. And sometimes one room is occupied by 100 uh, workers. This is Farij al Asmah in uh, the same issue in here, Qatar. Uh, al Asmah, the, the name of Al Asmah is uh, related to this house, which is Al, al Asmah family house, the first house. Uh, built in an asthma area, but unfortunately, that this uh, this house was n partially destroyed in 2013 because of a lack of co uh, collaboration and uh, lack of collaboration between different stakeholders in the city of Doha. And uh, the Farij al asthma is becoming as well. Uh, a refuge for low-income people, but since September 2014, the uh, private engineering office is, has freed all these houses from these occupants, and they started to do a major restoration work. This is just some pictures to show you the level and the dilapidation of this historic area, which led uh, to the demolition of many, uh, many houses and many I am in uh, witnesses of the past. This is one of the houses that Dr. Fodil mentioned about the student who did some work. This is uh, uh, Beit Zaman in Farij al Ghanem, which was completely, I mean, about to, to be uh, demolished. And thank God it has been uh, uh, at the last minute, I mean, restored due to some recommendation for, uh, for following that research. This is another area as well, sometimes the uh, remnants or what was demolished in the historic areas is becoming an informal parking in the heart of the city. And here it is uh, what the remaining, the, the, the only Barjil Tower house that is survived in the city of Doha. And this is a picture of this house. And this house used to house, I mean, the, the GCC country's folklore uh, center till 2005 when it stopped uh, its activities. I mean, during the 70s and the 1980s, uh, due to this dilapidation, there was a beginning of selective conservation, selective co of a number of historic monuments. And this is uh, one of the first historic monuments that has been, uh, I mean, restored in 1972 to 1975. It is the old palace, which is becoming part of the new National Museum, which was designed by the French architect Jean Nouvel. Uh, this is uh, the, the wind tower house that I said. I mean, one of the major uh, things that happened in Qatar was the institutions for the first time of a law protecting the cultural heritage in May 1980. And following that, this is the one of the first house that has been, uh, the second house that has been restored after the, uh, the first one of the museum. I mean, during the same area, in the Gulf area, there was a, a, a direction towards selective conservation and selective restoration. And this is another example in Dubai. This is the Beit Sheikh Saeed Al Maktoum, which was, I mean, restored during 1984, 1986. 
The, in Saudi Arabia, in Jeddah, the first restored house was a Nassif house in 1987. And then they started to broaden uh, the, the scope. And this is one of the rehabilitated, I mean, uh, souk like souk uh, waqf in uh, Qatar, but this is souk al-Arsa in Mereja area in uh, uh, Sharjah. A number of houses as well, a number of palaces started to be restored in Muharraq area in Bahrain, uh, and they have been rehabilitated and given new function. For example, Beit al-Sahafi, which is uh, the house of the journalist, a new life to historic buildings uh, with uh, major, I mean, support of Sheikh Hamey, who is the, the actual minister of culture in the government of Bahrain. Beit Sheikh Isa, this is as well uh, in uh, Muharraq. And then, I mean, if we take, for example, the case of Qatar, the case of Doha, what you can see in green is the few patches that have been survived from the huge, I mean, demolition pattern that happened after the discovery of oil during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and up to the 90s. And these are the uh, small patches that we can see. Uh, this is an Asmaq area. And this is uh, the Mshereb, which is undertaking, and this is the Ghanim. So we have about nine historic districts remaining. What can be done for them to be survived? What is the, the, the future for them? I think in 2011, UNESCO uh, instituted one major uh, approach, which is called uh, the Historic Urban Landscape Approach in t on the 10th of November 2011. This holistic approach intends to see the, the, the historic era as part of the city, not as something which is a part of something that should be dealt in, uh, I mean, uh, differently or dealt separately from all what happened. So it is a holistic approach by integrating the goals of urban heritage and those of social and economic development. So it becomes part. This model sees urban heritage as a social, cultural and economic asset for the development of the cities. So it becomes an element that should be taken, that should have its own uh, way. So it deals not only with the tangible, but also with intangible qualities. And it takes into account the existing built environment, intangible heritage, cultural diversity, socioeconomic and environmental, along with the local community values. So it is giving a new dimension to this historic area. However, in order to undertake this approach, there is a need to map, there is a need to document this uh, remaining historic uh, relics and this remaining historic areas. Here just uh, the shifting from dealing with, one, uh, with separate buildings and monuments to a holistic urban and, uh, development, urban regeneration, and one of the major or the first urban regeneration project that happened in Qatar is the Sukh Waqf during the, uh, the, the period 2004 to 2010. It marks one important, I mean, uh, urban intervention in the heart of the city. And it has become one of the major tourist attractions. And these are just some pictures showing the safe way, the safe workway and the Sika that has given this dimension of the feeling of safe of people, families, kids going to this area. There is another project as well in Muharraq, which is called Souq al Qaisariya. And this is uh, uh, an old Souq which has been demolished, uh, it has been completely reconstructed, inspiring from the local uh, architectural heritage and so on. This is the historic urban landscape approach that should be, uh, that should be the way uh, forward. So we need to ha have a, n uh, a number of actions and take a full assessment of the city's natural, cultural, and human resources. Use participatory planning and stakeholder consultation to decide on conservation aims. Assess the vulnerability of urban heritage to socioeconomic pressures and impacts of climate change. Integrate urban heritage values and their, uh, their vulnerability status into a wider framework work of the city development. So it's becoming something active, not static, just pre preserve it and leave it as a museum, but it comes a, a part of the city. Uh, make priorities of policies and actions for conservation 
and development, establish the appropriate public-private partnership, <coughs> develop mechanisms for the coordination of the various activities between the different actors. And this is one of uh, the, the important, the strong coordination which is needed for a sustainable mapping of this Khaliji heritage. And uh, we, uh, from the framework from the, two, the three days of the conference, I thought about the Qatar National Library of becoming the main point of integration and the collaboration between different, this is not all the list, but I just, I mean, picked out uh, the, the, uh, like the private engineering office who was behind the conservation of Sukhwak, uh, of Mshir properties, who are undergoing a major uh, work. Just the chair tell me when it's remaining five or one minute. Okay. Mshir properties are come in uh, at University of uh, University of Liverpool, Harvard University, the Arab Engineering Bureau uh, under the, uh, the direction of Brahim Jeda, the Qatar University, the Ministry of Municipals, and so on. So there, and Qatar museums as well. I mean, we try to to have this framework in order to, uh, to to feed it with the information. At least we have something that we can build down for the future, before it will be too late. This is just another. A major uh, project that was led by Sheikh Hamouza. It started in, uh, I think, 2006, 2008, and it should have, and it is in the, one of the uh, stages has been already finished, 2016, and it's still ongoing. The search for a new urban identity inspired from the past, as you can see. I will just conclude. Uh, digitizing the Khaliji urban heritage, it is the new challenge ahead. Despite the great efforts done to sustain the Khaliji cultural heritage, however long way it's still ahead, efforts should be coordinated around the Qatar National Library to set the path towards mapping and digitizing the surviving treasures of the Gulf heritage starting from today. And starting today because it, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow maybe it will be too late. Thank you very much indeed. Sorry for the time. Let me just interject here for a moment to go back to this very encouraging diagram. The uh, intention of the traditional Gulf architecture project, once it's up and running, uh, we intend to establish exactly this sort of network locally as well as globally. So uh, thank you very much for this. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is uh, my name is Raffaello. I I work for Qatar University. I am actually teaching design studio, comprehensive design, and urban design uh, at our master's studio. We have a few students here actually. Thank you, James, for uh, for organizing this event, this beautiful event. Thank you for inviting me and giving me the the chance to present my our research project because this research project was. <coughs> developed actually with our student at Qatar University. Uh, now, as mentioned, I, I joined Qatar University in 2014, and uh, since then I've been w living in Qatar. Before coming to Qatar, I was in the, Emir in the Emirates for a couple of years and in Australia for like 12 years, and before that in Italy where I graduated. Now, one of the main... Um, we had a chance to discuss with the delegate the importance and the concern of this, the major concern of this event. And we believe, and I agree with Sanya that was mentioning that there is a disconnection between uh, the way we build and the way we educate, or the way we have even been trained. And um, I mean, for me, it was, it was interesting after many years working as a project manager and, or an, ar and an architect uh, to go back to study in a way, because working in the academia means, at least my, my point of view, means, uh, well, learning again. So this was sort of the path. Now, I, I really found extremely interesting all the session presented, and I would like to thank all of you, all the presenters for, because the session has been very, very informative. Now, I agree, basically, I agree that uh, it is important to 
digitalize the data, um, record the data, but as an architect and urban design, I wonder how do we utilize this data? We just store the data in our museum, in our bookcase, and as you, as they say, a kalas, or we utilize the data to design, I don't know, beautiful settlement, more livable settlement. Now, as I said, I'm Italian, and uh, um, I don't know if you had a chance to go to Italy, but in Italy we have these beautiful, amazing medieval cities. I feel sad when I see, see that these medieval cities are abandoned sometimes, because the principle, I believe, that the principle of sustainable urbanism, uh, urban sociology, green urbanism, and so on, are embedded into these uh, cities. I feel even sadder when I see that new settlement are not even designed considering what has been designed in the past. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to copy and paste. I mean, a few uh, yesterday, I was admiring the, um, I mean, listening carefully to the presentation of Ibrahim Jeddah, for example, who is, a, um, I don't really believe he's a traditional architect. He's an architect that is reviewing the traditional principle of this country, of this region as well. So when I was at university, when I was, my final, was, I was doing my final year, I read an interesting book, which is called L'Architettura della Città, The Architecture of the City. It was written by Aldo Rossi, a famous at the time architect. And uh, he was actually arguing that in order to design this uh, livable settlement, we need to go and have a look again at the traditional city, at the European traditional city in this context. So the purpose of this, back now to the to this study, which was developed as a Senegal University. The aim of the study is, uh, is to understand how and the extent to which the special form of the souk wakif contribute to the formation of social interaction. Now, the presentation is a structure um, into four parts. There is the review, I mean, we have the review of the literature, the research design, the findings subdivided into categories, and the conclusions. Now, the literature review, uh, review sorry, is divided into the disciplinary context and the cultural geographical context. Urban design. Okay, we are talking about uh, uh, urban design, sustainable urbanism, urban sociology. Now, urban design is a multifaceted collaborative disciplinary process. It is a process of shaping the settlement or part of the city, the city, to, in order to make it more livable. Urban sociology is the study of life, <coughs> excuse me, and the human interaction in the metropolitan areas of city. It is nothing else than the study of the structure and problem of urban spaces. I mean, this is done in order to provide input for planning and policy making. Uh, yesterday, uh, several uh, presenters talk, talk about uh, tangible and intangible uh, uh, factors, uh, key principles, and so on. Now, the smart urban growth of our city should be based on addressing these tangible and intangible <coughs> factors. But according to the presentation I heard, we are a little bit lacking the attention to the intangible factors. So the way we build a settlement a city, a district, in probably in Qatar, in the UAE, or in probably in any, uh, well, I'm talking about nowadays, in, um, in the Gulf, is exactly the same way we would build it probably in Italy, in Australia, and in other places. Is this the way, is this the way to do it? So in order to really understand how we can implement livability, how these uh, social spaces can contribute to the implementation of livability within our settlement, we actually, we went back. We went back and we studied the, the formation of the Islamic city. So we went back to history and we analyzed sort of the role of the mosque, the role of the souk, the role of the residential quarters, and so on. I'll go fast. 
after that, we, um, we went through our geographical, or after the historical sort of analysis, we went through a geographical analysis. So we tried to understand Qatar. How Qatar is development, what are the needs of Qatar as well? So the, as we all know, the state of Qatar is part of the GCC. It is divided into seven municipalities. And the population of this country has quadrupled in the, um, from 1986 to 2010 due to the wealth of oil and gas. As, as we all know, I'm just, it's just a repetition, I know. But the, um, the discovery of oil and gas changed this country, changed the entire region. So this means that new projects were started, the new cities were developed, and the population increased as well. Now, Qatar is also trying uh, to diversify its economy, I mean, into uh, three, ma in three um, sort of subsectors. Tourism, Qatar is aiming at becoming the center of the region knowledge economy, and it's finally focusing on the real estate uh, economy. The development of Qatar is uh, sort of, um, we cannot say directed, but it's uh, envisioned by the Qatar National Development Framework, which is a special strategy to guide new development in Qatar. This is a, these are some views that have, uh, have already been shown, actually, in the previous um, presentation where we can really see the development of, well, the physical development of Doha, the capital of, of Qatar. Now, the Doha, the, in the city of Doha, we studied uh, Doha from a urban design planning point of view. We try to understand uh, what are the major sta urban growth stages that Doha went through. And there are, we identified three um, stages, the early pearl, uh, period of pearling and fishing, the expansion of the ring roads, and then the development of the mega project, the project which is the phase, we, the phase we are living nowadays. Now, though, uh, though, the state of Qatar is going through the development of major public transportation system. Now, my argument is that, my, not just my argument, the argument of probably most of us is that the development of these transportation systems will change dramatically, radically, the built environment of Doha. Because here yeah, the issue is not just building the railway. The issue here is building 101 or 105, I don't remember the exact number, of transit-oriented development. Transit-oriented development are urban villages. These urban villages will be, well, built, some of them from scratch, from zero. So, my interest and uh, curiosity is, uh, and my main question is, how do we build this settlement? Do we build the settlement the way we have been doing it in the past 20 years in most of the Western countries? Or do we really address these intangible factors for the development of the city? So these are some... Um, diagrams and aerial view of the new of the new uh, metro the new uh, metro which has four lines mm -hmm. now from um, from a urban design point of view one of the most interesting features of Doha is the corniche the corniche is is the big connector is linking the new Doha to the old one west bay to the souk The state of Qatar, like, well, the Gulf countries, I would say, are, are, facing, um, are facing globalization and, and loss of identity as well. Um, this definitely can be, uh, can be, how do I say, can be seen visibly in places like Dubai. From my point of view, the state of Qatar is still managing well. I mean, they are still uh, investing funds. They are still trying to preserve their heritage. In a, from my per personal point of view, in a more sensitive point of view, in a more sensitive uh, perspective compared to other, to the neighbor's country. Now, this is also, um, Again, the preservation of cultural values and the attempt to develop a modern country is uh, actually um, 
well, led through a document which is called Qatar National Vision 2030. They document uh, the strategy is based on four pillars, human development, social development, economic development, and environmental development. Now, it has already, we already talked about the Souk Wakif, uh, the location where the Souk Wakif is, um, what it means, the standing, the standing market. Uh, it was rebuilt as per the traditional architectural language of the country. We tend to analyze we tend to analyze a lot the architectural language of the buildings. We tend to analyze a lot the architecture of the place. But what about the spatial form of the, of, of the souk walking? What about the, the spaces? Because in my, from my point of view, that is the real uh, key. That is what makes the souk walking rich, a beautiful place where to spend your time, to spend your evening. So, some of my colleagues, I lived in West Bank, some of my colleagues told me, you know, you, you cannot live outside in summertime. Yeah, there are 50, 45, 50 degrees. How do you explain that in the Souk Wakif, there is always people, no matter when? So, because it is an extreme, a very, well, it is a livable place. So. The design. The Souk Wakif was designed by Mohamed Ali Abdullah, which we met yesterday, and he gave us a beautiful presentation as well. So he was rebuilt in a traditional way, trying to preserve the vernacular architectural form. Now, the artist interviewed local inhabitants of the area. So he talked to the stakeholders. He talked to the users. He talked to his own people. This is another important element in order to design, a, um, well, urban villages, a settlement, and so on. I'll go fast because I have only a few minutes. The, res the research design is based on a collection of oral, oral and visual data. The, the data has been categorized according to some categories, as we can see now. The findings. The findings have been divided into four categories, the square, the street, the cafe, or and or restaurant and the urban furniture. Now, why the urban square, the cafe, and the street? This is a framework that. Uh, mm, well, well, this is this is a framework derived from the literature that we uh, we review. Stevenson, in particular, way the city. Now, the urban square, sorry, the cafe and the street is the public re realm. Are the open spaces where social interaction are enhanced. So we also realized that, uh, I mean, according to the data that we uh, collected, most visitors um, highlighted that there is a lack, they believe there is a lack of urban furniture. We categorize uh, the urban furniture and the, and the categories which should be implemented within the Souk Wakif. So for example, one is planting, lack of benches, uh, some shading devices. These, uh, these town squares are quite, uh, they're not shaded, especially in summertime. So again, urban furniture can, or urban features, can really implement, well, the livability of the Souk Wakif, the signage and so on. Now, conclusion discussion, a urban space is successful when it contributes to the contribution of social interaction and or enhancement of livability. I am not an enemy of contemporary architecture. I love contemporary architecture. I believe that some of the most beautiful buildings, contemporary design building, are in Qatar, are here. Doha Tower, the Islamic Museum, the New Museum, the, um, the Isozaki Convention Center in front of us here. This building, Ram Kula's building, not far from here. These are amazing jewels, they're beautiful. The problem is not the iconic building. The iconic building is a beauty, is the outcome of a genius, the architect. But if this building is not connected to the other buildings, if there is no urban design, there is no livability. If I live in my tower in West Bay and I want to play football, soccer, or whatever, with my kid, my kid is not here, but anyway, <laughs> I, cannot, I, I cannot go on the ground floor and play football, for example, or even, I don't know, have a walk, because the ground floor is surrounded by cars, car parts. 
So how do we fix that? Exactly the way they fix it at the souk, underground car park. So it is not that complicated. It is quite easy. So we need to have a look at what has been, has been built in the past. We don't need to copy and paste. As I said, we need to collaborate. We need to understand how to make this urban settlement, especially the new one, the new one coming, the 101 uh, that will be built. How do we make this settlement livable? So collaboration, the architect should collaborate with the urban planner, the urban design, the sociologist, the transportation engineer, and so on. It is a multifaceted, a multi, well, challenging task as well. If we don't collaborate with the historian, if we don't collaborate, we miss something. We will archive our data. We will archive our data in our beautiful library. But what for? Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not that much interested in introducing myself uh, professionally, but I want to introduce uh, my character and my position. I am a nasty guy. <laughs> I'm so interested in provoking and stimulating people. I'm not necessarily politically correct. So bear with me that I will torture you for the coming 20 minutes. <laughs> this is the main title of my uh, work, but the subtitle is by far more important, contesting the fake and the authentic. I love asking a lot of questions. And therefore, I will start by a question and I will end also by questions. Questions, conceptual bases, observations. I will talk about the whole notion of authenticity, <coughs> examining some cases, and then I will conclude. And my fundamental question, my basic question is, is any of those buildings constructs part of Qatar's identity? Or it's only about the past? What is happening now is not included, is not contributing? I think this is a fundamental question. Because it seems to me, once we talk about the whole notion of heritage and identity, we quickly go to the past. So this is my initial question. Which is part of Qatar's identity? And then my conceptual triology is based on three main terminologies. The authentic, the fake, and the authentic fake. And I will elaborate. <laughs> and before elaboration on the three concepts, I want to talk about this tendency towards generalization. Too much generalization. We talk about the Gulf. I lived in Bahrain for five years where you can go from Manama to Muharraq in five minutes on my bike. And people in Muharraq are talking about people in Manama as if it's a different country, different kind of food, different kind of language, different kind of lifestyle, and so on and so forth. So how come suddenly we generalize everything? Traditional architecture in the Gulf, Gulf community, right? So. The issue of similarities and peculiarities versus resemblance and distinctiveness should be considered. And at the same time, what is happening now, the contemporary moment, and in my opinion, is fundamentally important. I remember that I wrote an article called uh, Crime and Punishment, Contemporary Gulf Cities, where I was saying, well, these guys, they had a lot of money. They built skyscrapers and we gave them hard time. And then they start to build schools and universities, and we gave them again hard time. And they start to build museums, and we gave them hard time. And in all these stages, we were never able to pose and to say, so what, we, what they can do, how we can provide honest advice. It seems to me also that the whole notion of our connection to the heritage 
in the past went through very interesting paradigms. And I think the very basic paradigm was the paradigm of documentation. But we fall in love in this paradigm. We document, and then we document the documented, and then we archive the documented, and digitize the documented, and use 3D scanners to document in 3D the previously documented, and then we use drawings to make sure that we documented all what is documented. Beautiful paradigm. And then from that, and again, it's our responsibility, experts, architects, urban designers, people concerned about the whole notion of heritage, that we decided to have what I called it negative conservation. We preserve buildings and we close it. You cannot even touch it. You cannot even get close to it. And therefore, inevitable deterioration. And then we went to the paradigm of rehabilitation of isolated buildings. And ironically, we suggested functions in all of these examples all over the Gulf that has, have nothing to do with the local community. We have tourists, the elite, the sophisticated people going to all of these places after it has been renovated to listen to Bach or Mendelssohn and the rest of the local community feel that what is going on here? We're not attached to it. We're not related to it. Nobody's fulfilling our dreams and aspirations. And then finally, the model of the heritage village, introducing the fake heritage. And again, we were responsible for that. Every single city in the Gulf built a heritage village. And we take kids, and we take families, and we have ceremonies there to celebrate the fakeness and to say that we are so proud of our heritage and we are so keen about preserving the heritage. And then we are also having what I would call it the trap of identity. How we determine which is representing our identity, which history, which chapter in our history we, wait, we, we stopped the project at 1940. No, we will extend it to 1960. No, we will extend it to 1980. Those buildings, we have to preserve it because it's a representation of our heritage. But those buildings, they're not representing our heritage. How? Who is making this decision? According to what? Did we test this with the local community? Did we test that with the people that built those buildings? And ironically, what we are calling for now in terms of preservation and reservation, we are the one who made the decision for that to be destroyed, and it's happening all over the Gulf. Group of experts decided that those kind of buildings really have no value. And here, some activists, they were witnessing beautiful modern buildings like the Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Kuwait, and they destroyed it because it's not a representation of a specific period of their identity. And therefore, we went into the whole issue of deconstructing and reconstructing our heritage, because we are not that much clear about which to keep and what not to keep. And therefore, we kept on losing things and adding things in a process that again went through this triology of authentic fake and authentic fake. Another very important issue about the trap of identity is the social component of identity. There's some very distinguished feature about the Gulf, which is population, the mosaic of people. You're talking about a, a very best situation in Bahrain where you have almost 50% of the population are expa expatriates. So even when we talk about the whole notion of identity, where is the social dimension here? Do I have the right to participate in the, in, the, in the identity of Qatar because I'm living in Qatar for the last 10 years? Or I have to maintain a sort of uh, sense of outsider. I don't belong here. And this is, again, very important when you talk about cultural intervention and cultural preservation. Because it seems to me that I am also one way or another in this dialogue of cultural kind of exchange. And therefore, it seems to me that 
a multi a multicultural ethics and more blurred boundaries are needed to sort of complement this beautiful, unique tapestry of people within Gulf cities. And what is more amazing that we, when we move this notion of the trap of identity to architecture, again we will see that we promote very, very interesting interpretation of identity. Here, for instance, we are talking about truly Riviera Arabia. I don't know how this is related to Arabia and the Riviera. And then you have a beautiful Muhajjaba lady with another lady, very modern. So, you know, it's, it's, a mat it's as if it's the statement and manifestation of radical confusion. And we need some sort of clarity about what exactly we're doing here. And then the power of the copy. This is the pyramid. I'm originally from Cairo, Egypt. We, all the time we were to, when I was allowed to go to Egypt, all the time we take people to go to the pyramid to talk about our heritage. And then we had a professor coming. And then he stopped in front of the pyramid and he said, but this is too small. And we said, what do you mean too small? He said, the other one is really huge. And I said, which other one? And he said, the one in Las Vegas, it's by far bigger. You can go inside and have a drink and eat, and it's, it's a beautiful place, yeah. This is the dominance of the copy. Well, this might be an individual case. How about the Eiffel Tower? The Eiffel Tower, <coughs> after the exception in Paris, a lot of people were writing a sort of request to be demolished. Now the Eiffel Tower is the landmark of Paris. Not only that, it's also the landmark of Las Vegas. But more ironically, it is used as a catalyst for urban development in Dubai. This is a huge urban development project called the Falcon City of Wonders, <laughs> where you can have replica of the Eiffel Tower, the pyramid, and also the Great Wall of China all in one place. So buy an apartment here, you will enjoy the whole world. And then another copy, but in my own opinion, the most valuable copy. This is a copy of Taj Mahal. But this copy was added to it, a very authentic layer. The layer of how this beautiful, wonderful old man felt that he really lost his wife. Not like the rich Maharaja that ordered to have this uh, Taj Mahal, the original Taj Mahal, but this guy saved every single penny for a long number of years to be able to build this for her. So it's a copy, but it has this original kind of layer within it. Right? And then Dubai heard about that, so they had a, a Taj Mahal, a Taj Arab, Taj Arab, Taj Arab Hotel. Let me move from this to some case studies where I can shed light on the whole notion of authentic fake and authentic fake. And I wanna focus on the notion of the souks because I think souks are very, very important spatial places because not only of the spatial composition, but the social interaction within these kind of spaces. And also because there are spaces to learn and to understand, and to be inspired. This is Medina to Jumeirah in Dubai. Beautiful, beautiful development, uh, historical development along the, the Gulf. And uh, they have different kind of uh, renovated souks. Some friends, some of them actually are professors in different universities in, uh, in UAE. They took me there to show me how they are preserving the heritage. And they showed me the language that it's used in the place. Beautiful, beautiful language. And you see bajers, and you see how the places are packed with people, and the beautiful, beautiful roofs. <coughs> Not only that, you get closer and you see how people are interacting, how these places are vibrant. Beautiful waterfront. And then I asked, when this was built? And they said a couple of years ago. It has nothing to do with heritage. It has nothing to do with the past. It's a purely real estate project, but it's packed with people. People are happy, not only happy, 
They are using the project as a representation of their heritage and identity. Look at the power of the authentic fake. And then go to Bahrain, beautiful country. Souq Bab al Bahrain. There is a, literally a gate that was the sort of the connection between the port and the city and the souk called Bab al Bahrain. And once you go inside, there was a vibrant souk with some interesting kind of, uh, again, I would say the first wave of globalization coming from Iran, from Iraq, from Yemen, from Zinzibar, from all over the place. And you see the sort of the, 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 the new global kind of pace of development and the old fabric of the city. And this is, the gate is like the sort of a, on the edge of this interesting transformation between the two fabrics. And you can see it here more, this, the, the duality between the two kind of language and the two kind of urban settings. But what was to me very interesting about the souk <coughs> is what is happening in the souk. Not necessarily what people are selling, but also the authenticity of the events, the notion of the event place and how the souk in specific times of the year will be sort of a place for people during the time of Ashura. So the whole spatial composition of the place is transformed into a very unique and creative manner to express uh, the rituals of the festival of Ashura from multicultural uh, and racial uh, Shias groups. Even they're sort of, they have a very interesting performance within the, those uh, uh, spaces. And the whole, the whole kind of third dimension of the place is also changed dramatically because of their beliefs and their way of expressing the uh, rituals. And then they started to innovate, to innovate the souk because it's good to innovate the souk from time to time. We want to attract more people. So what they did trying to innovate the souk, let's go to traditional architecture. Let's look at the old previously archived, we talked about documentation before, the previously archived vocabulary and try to imitate it. Let's have a badger, not necessarily that it would work, but we need a badger and we need some of the different kind of visual elements that's used in the place. And even let's create some public spaces that would never, never accommodate the kind of authentic rituals and festivals that were used to be uh, accommodated in the place. And then let's add the flavor of the mold too. So suddenly what was kind of very authentic place, gradually it's moving into a typical mold that you can see it in any part of the, of the region. And then my third, pla uh, my third place is Sukwakif. You had enough dose of Sukwakif. <laughs> but I will go to the other extreme because I think Sukwakif is beautifully, beautifully, beautifully fake project. But it's a beautifully fake because it has different kind of other authentic layers. The whole story about Muhammad Ali way, w w listening to people describing the place for him. That was, has nothing to do with Sukwakif. Sukwakif was never like that. This is the authentic copy that was constructed. But it was very positive construction, and I will elaborate. This is a, a souk is about display of products, talent, it's opportunity to share and meet with people from different cultures and that was maintained. Within the souk, you will see this trilogy very, very expressed. Maybe some traces of an old hotel called Bismillah Hotel. But then the rest is a sort of process of adding more layers to this fake and authentic fake. All of these are buildings that were never there, were never been there before. But it's beautiful. People are enjoying it. Not only that, even my dear scholars are talking about it as a representation of Qatar's identity. Beautiful. I don't have any problem with that. But we need to sort of shed light on this originality of that. And again, a beautiful display of products, talents, sharing goods. 
extended uh, experience that were never been in Qatar before, have never been in Qatar before, the notion of your ability to walk in a place in Qatar. I remember I came to Qatar 10 years before, and there was no place to walk for us. You cannot walk. You cannot walk in Qatar, basically. And then suddenly, Souk Waqif is coming to present for us, to construct for us a very unique spatial experience, a different kind of interaction between people and places. But what is, what is also important in our analysis of the souk here, that in the process of building the souk, we also destroyed a lot of heritage, a lot of chapters of Qatar's urbanism and Doha's urbanism were totally demolished. But at that time, we felt that we ha it's a legitimate approach to destroy all of this because we are extending the fake. So we destroyed the authentic to extend the fake, but this is also acceptable. And what is ironic, that we cannot stop the process of gradual invasion of the fake towards the fabric of the city, because we feel that it's a beautiful experience. So we keep on bu building without trying to understand that small is beautiful. And this is the whole beauty about originality, that you have this sense of limited growth not only that, we transformed Souk Waqif into a brand. Every city in Qatar, they want to have their own souk. And I think tomorrow you'll go to Waqra, right? Yeah, they have Souk Waqif in Waqra. They called it that, Souk Waqif in Waqra. And then there's a competition now that, not, not architecture and urban competition, I mean competition between the municipalities. I just had uh, in the Ministry of Municipality a meeting with some of them, telling them why you have to have one more Souk Waqif. Dig in the history of your place. Find the narrative of your place, the story of your place, and come up with something out of this, instead of trying to find Souk Waqif. Because Souk Waqif in Wakra is a deserted place. It's more like cinematic, theoretical, the theoretical kind of uh, decor, because there's no life there. But in Souk Waqif, people are having fun, because of, the, as I said, this uh, interesting process, integration between the authentic, the fake, and the authentic fake. So people are walking, eating, drinking, and smoking shisha, of course. So I want to conclude by saying that I think there is a sort of a triumph for those authentic fake places. They are very successful. And I, I, I spend a lot of time trying to analyze why those places are really successful. Successful to the extent that not only from a frequency of usage, but successful in the sense that they change our perception. They change the perception of the people that started to look at these places as a representation of their identity and the most valuable chapters in the history. Because, number one, they provide vibrant, livable, and entertaining connection with the past. We were not able to do that when we preserve buildings and close it. Or we rehabilitate building and give it a function that would only speak to the minority of the community rather than the community as a whole. It's providing new spatial experience on the level of national level and also on the, uh, on the level of the city. Something that we're, people have never experienced it before. The positive dialogue between the old and new, particularly when it comes to the program, the functions, the different kind of facilities that is, are, are integrated there. The cross-generational approach and of, uh, the appreciation of heritage is not directed to old people, it's not directed to white people, it's not directed to children, it's directed to the whole community. You go to Souk Waqif and every single sector of the community is represented there. The shift from focus on monumental building to a holistic urban setting, this is also a very common thing in all of these authentic fake, authentic fake projects. They were able to shift gear from focusing on a single building to deal with an urban setting that would speak again to the whole community. And then the behavioral sort of change that made people believe to sort of start to subscribe to a process of constructing a new identity this notion of authenticity of something that they know that it's fakely produced. And then finally, I want to stress the fact 
That notion, the notion of identity, it's not a product. We all the time talk about identity as if it's a product. I would subscribe to the interpretation that identity is a process. And every single day in the history of any city or any country or any person is adding to this multi kind of accumulated uh, notion of identity. So thank you so much for listening to my authentic fake and authentic fake. Story. I'm sure that the session brought up a lot of questions and made us question a lot of things in relation to preservation of traditional architecture, maybe relevant to identity or authenticity, or even the way we think about the future and look back to the past. So the floor is open for questions. If anyone has any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I very much enjoyed the session, so thanks to all the speakers. Uh, and this is a question for all the speakers, and it's a very open one. Um, it strikes me that one of the reasons that Zuwakiv is so successful is that it's a, a, a place of interaction and encounters. It's a, it's a truly urban space, which you don't get much of in the Gulf cities these days, where people are in their cars, and they're in their offices, and they're in their suburbs, and in their, uh, their gated compounds, or their villas, or whatever. And it's the only place that I can think of uh, where large numbers of people of different background do come together and mix in a way that perhaps they used to do uh, before um, modern town planning and before uh, the advent of the oil industry completely changed the nature of the Gulf towns. Um, and it, it reminds me very much of the way that the souk used to function in the pre-oil and early Gulf, Gulf towns as a place of encounter and dialogue and, and mixture. Um, the question I have is, is there any other space that you can imagine that this kind of uh, place of interaction could be recreated or encouraged to appear in Doha or anywhere else in this region? Um, because I only see it in Sukhwakiv, actually, which is one of the interesting things. But I'm wondering if you can see any potential to bring about this kind of urban life and urban um, vibrancy in any other scenario? And what are the qualities that you see in Sukhwakiv which could be transposed to other venues within the town? That's basically what I'm saying. Well, it might sound, uh, uh, how can I say, not disturbing, but I would, p I would choose, I would pick definitely West Bay. If it's me, but well, I lived in West Bay, and um, and I think it was an amazing place where to live. And I lived in Musheri, close to the Souk, and it was another amazing place where to live. The problem with the modern contemporary development of uh, West Bay is that there is no uh, ground floor. The ground floor is completely utilized to park cars. So there is even walking from the tower where I was staying, for example, to city center, it was a bit of a challenge. I mean, you need to run. <laughs> you need to be a good, not a good runner, but in some cases, it can be a bit dangerous. So if we can, you know, rethink about the ground floor plan of the entire settlement, it would be easy to make it livable and enjoy really these beautiful, beautiful, amazing towers, I believe. Uh, I think one of the issues in the Gulf uh, is rarity. I mean, when you have a rarity, if you have something, it becomes very uh, attractive and very valuable. So if you take the case of Sukhwakov, I think it's the first urban intervention after dealing with uh, like Dr. Ali said, isolated buildings, isolated monuments. So this is the first experience. And there is no other experience that is competed, uh, co uh, competing with it. <coughs> and I think one of the issues, uh, uh, one of the, uh, the good thing of the so is the human dimension. I mean, it's not just the built heritage. It's not just the, 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 the mortar and the brick or the, the, or the stone or whatever, but it's the people. 
it's the melting and it's the, the convention of international communities there in one space. It's the experience. This is why, uh, like Dr. Ali was saying, that there is another Sukh work of which is uh, being, uh, which is being developed in uh, uh, in Al-Wakra, and maybe w another one will be developed in Al-Khur or whatever. I think the experience, it's the human dimension, it's the activity, it's the intangible heritage that gives Sukhwaqaf this dimension. It's not just the the built the built up area. Okay. Uh, I want to add to Dr. Jamil actually about the Sugwag why is, is so attracted you know people so the Sugwa is so attractive to people actually because it came during a time when Qatar was missing really having any heritage place even if it's not you know authentic as Dr. Ali said which I agree with him about it but the location is authentic the, the, the rule of the Sug is authentic but the building are actually a re-creation and it's, uh, it's, uh, it was created but if if we think about if you visit any country in the world, first thing you would like to see actually is to visit a heritage site in this place or in this country rather than visiting the skyscrapers or any uh, postmodern uh, architecture. You will choose actually automatically will choose to go to a heritage site which can represent the heritage and the culture of this uh, country. So I think that the, the Sug is very attractive because people did not have any you know like a heritage site it's all a site called a heritage site before in Qatar a part of uh, this one so there was a threat uh, um, uh, what how can I put it they were thirsty to have you know a heritage site where can find themselves especially with those uh, urban development around uh, us in Qatar, most of heritage sites and uh, ar uh, traditional architecture were demolished. And we, were, we are living now in very, you know, modern uh, style houses. So they, they were thirsty to find a place where can escape from the modern lifestyle and go back. It's like nostalgic thing, I think. Well, I would, I would just add, uh, a remark regarding a very interesting real, pro real estate project here in, in Doha, and I'm not sure how many of you were able to visit the Pearl. Uh, the Pearl is very interesting because they have a beautiful, beautiful promenade where you walk and enjoy the Gulf and the boats and a lot of restaurants and coffee places are scattered around. But you go anywhere, anytime, and you feel that it's deserted. It's not that vibrant. And then you walk only three, four hundred meters to the depth of the project to a new area called Medina Central, and it's packed with people. Now, we have to question why. And I think it was because of the ability to attain the concept of to see and to be seen. And this is why I'm th I think understanding the local culture is fundamentally important. Here in Qatar, they love to do something called iftar al sayara <laughs> which is to go around with your car in a distance of two or three hundred meters and you can spend two or three hours doing that because you're driving a Ferrari or a Porsche and you need the maximum number of people to see that. So suddenly, although this might, uh, might sound like sarcastic, but it's creating a very interesting pattern, a very, crea uh, a very interesting event so the street or the public place is becoming sort of a theater, and people are watching other people and talking and eating and so on and so forth. So in the same real estate project, you have a beautiful waterfront that is designed according to the best urban design principles that's coming from global urban and architectural schools. And you have another space which coincidentally is speaking to the needs and desires and actual sort of way of life of the locals. So it's a, it's a very vibrant. Snyder. Please. Th thank you very much. Uh, obviously, we have been all dealing with this paradox that you have explained and you call fake. Uh, 
It is fake and it is not fake. In a way, I wonder if it's because we, li we are living in this transitional state of existence, which is an unresolved state in which during the day, when supposedly we are awake, well, we reside in the modern. We reside in this building or we reside in the office buildings that are created. It's another world. And then at night we wake up or maybe we go to sleep. And in that state of dreaming, we go to Sukha Waghev because it's another life that we also enjoy, but we're living in a paradoxical state in which we can't integrate these two lives. I think this is going back to the business of identity. We appreciate who we have been, we think, in terms of our past. There are values in it that our fathers and forefathers and mothers shared with us, told us stories about. We lived it that way when we visited our grandmother. However, we have not developed a philosophy that takes that world into the 21st century. So we are living in a world in which we have not developed an integrated philosophy of that world of our values and the material existence that is the 21st century. Until we develop such an integration, we will exist in this virtual day-night condition which gives us no identity. I believe that today this is not a issue of just we in Doha. I believe that modern human being has no coherent world view because we're faced with two fundamental different world views. We're faced with the scientific world view that says from a big bang of 14 billion years ago came something out of a flash, out of a series of particles and waves coagulated in time came the earth and the world that we know and Ali and Madame and Yeshu and Yishun and Haim. Yeah? This is what we're told. Yet, there is the entire other world of the revealed book. In our condition, it is Gabriel telling us the story of the Islamic creation myths or the Noah or in the Judaic faith or in the Buddhist faith, okay? So there are this dichotomy of what you may call the revelations of faith and the revelations of science. Until we develop some philosophic integration that is a unified integration, there'll be no identity because we will exist in these two worlds that are never today able to match. And so at one point we jump on one side and we jump on another side. And this is the dialogue that is going on. And God knows when we will develop that integration. Until that time, we will exist in a dichotomy and we will do what we're doing, I think. Thank you, Nadra. Yes, Vincent? I'd like to make a comment in between authentic and fake. You said that the new souk is named Al Waqaf. But Marawal, it was named Al Ahmad. I so sorry, I, uh, I said what? The souk was named now, is named now Al Waqaf. But if Al Waqaf, Souk Waqaf. Before it was named Al Ahmad. It was the real name, Souk Ahmad. Yes. I, I was not talking about the name of the souk. Anyway, I would, I would like to... to oh, yeah, it's a comment. I would like to, to say something also. Just behind the Fort Al-Qut, 
there was a big cemetery. Remember, every one of you, a cemetery is a holy place. Instead of this cemetery, I think you, you buried the, the cars under. Did you take off the skeletons or did you bury the skeletons under the cars? Sir, are you talking about the name of the souk or the fate of the bodies? <laughs> so we can elaborate. <laughs> two. Because two but different two. stories. Both, well, I don't know about the notion of Al-Ahmadi souk, to be honest with you. Maybe yeah. Professor Jamal, do you, do you know b more about that? Mm -hmm. But my limited readings in the name suggest that it was called it was called Souk Waqif because people used to trade while standing, right? It was, it now, was behind, now, it was behind Al Kut. Okay, so maybe also the name is wrong and this. It's in the corner. It's in the corner. So if the name is wrong. Yeah. So if you suggest that. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so why did they change that the, the name? name is wrong. This would actually add to my argument that yeah. even the name is the fake. <laughs> but. But, but I want to go to the notion uh -huh. about that somewhere, right? It doesn't matter, yeah. Doesn't it's, matter. I mean, the only name left, everything is fake. How about the name? Fine. <laughs> when it comes to the notion, <laughs> when it comes to the notion of uh, the bodies, uh, uh, I think, again, my colleagues would elaborate, but according to uh, is Islamic sort of uh, beliefs, you can evacuate the bodies and keep the site open for a good number of years. This is part of the traditions here. And then after that, you can use it. So I would guarantee for you that you wouldn't feel bodies and cars. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it was really nice, uh, nice discussions with yes. uh, Ali Abdurraouf. I really like and uh, not get scared. Being scared, yeah? Ah, zombies all over. <laughs> what, what did come? Can you can yeah. you raise the microphone, please? Yes. Yeah. When it comes, I mean, it is interesting discussion, but I think we, in terms when we do research, we always do get out of this discussion with something, right? Usually when it comes to traditional architecture, traditional cities, and so on, uh, in the scientific tradition, is first is try to understand what happened, what makes this city as they look. And when we understand, we try to explain to other, other people, this is the reason where it comes. And then the third part of any research is to predict, to help the new designer to make cities that are more livable. And in my point of view, there is when we talk about traditional architecture, traditional cities, sometimes it's vernacular, sometimes we get into authentic. I think the, the rule of the games are not clear. What is traditional? Yeah, anyway, if we look at traditional buildings, uh, they are really uh, buildings or cities that are raised out of many series of trials and errors. So it's an accumulated experience. And at the same time, there is always an optimization process that led to the creation of the cities. Optimization in terms of not only materials, building materials, construction, even the social context is optimized. So the neighbors, when they build their houses, they take into consideration how the other house is built. And this is what makes this city very interesting. So for me, uh, when it comes, and I, I hope, I don't know if you agree with me, studying these um, traditional cities is more to understand the optimization process that happens, that can help me in my design, than rather to almost uh, glorify too much. And I can believe, I can guarantee you, there is a lot of mystification about traditional cities. Sometimes they are totally wrong. Sometimes they are not suitable for our time. They were suitable for a certain time, period of time, but they are not now. And this is where people do not do the same thing. This is where they move from modern buildings and so on. They have other needs. So for when we see traditional buildings, I would say more I prefer more the word contextual. When you see contextual in its broader sense, when you say technology, what happened economically and so on, and then contextual becomes, if we say it, rep it, represent, it, it um, respond to the context of that time, then what we are doing now is always responding to the context. So there is nothing wrong with modern architecture. No. Uh, absolutely nothing. And uh, let me just try to, because I took some note to keep the 
fate of my day, my, my Can you make it short, please? We're yes. running out of time. So this is for me, um, I, I, I will not continue, because this is a very uh, broad discussion. Is I agree, Jamal. What do we do with I share all the office this? for three years. Yes. I, I, <laughs> 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 I agree. I agree with you. Indeed, uh, I don't believe that the TOD, the transit oriented development, can be designed, developed, built uh, um, in a on bracket, a traditional way. We cannot uh, build the a new souk within the new transit oriented development. We need to go through. We need to have uh, a development based on density, diversification, uh, design, and so on. Now, I'm not against, again, the skyscrapers or modern contemporary buildings, but we need to, um, the way we use this building is more or less the way we used it many years ago. So still, we need to buy milk and bread. So now, it is, in my view, there is no diversification about uh, day and night. There is diversification about day and night when I just leave the tower I go downstairs and I find nothing, so I need to go to the souk. But if I find whatever I need within West Bay, for example, if it's West Bay, I don't need to go to the souk. So we need just to implement these uh, urban villages or new development. Doesn't mean that we have to build them with the same human um, scale that we utilized years ago. Now, I just want to ask, because I can use no microphone. Because what I wanted to reach with my, my discussions, and this is we see it in, in uh, Nordic countries, uh, these, what is it, the process, the, the way cities are built, there's a lot of people participation. They yeah. build their cities. And this is what makes if we see traditional city. And I've been myself in real case experience in the last land my, uh, my uncles divided, the way they decided the street, the way they decided how it will be. It's really deciding the, how the city will look when it will be built. And this is in people participations, getting people into the process. This is what guarantees a better integration or interaction of people. But if you build a city and then you try people to get into it, how they can interact? They have been not involved in the process. It doesn't mean we have to ask them for everything, but usually, in, at least in all the country, whenever there is a master plan in any region, it is exposed and people discuss it with the urban planner, urban designer, architect, explaining to people, and then they can give their points. And then when people give their points, participate, they adopt the city. Then it becomes their city. And this is what I wanted to do. Yeah. Thank you very much for your comment. And um, I would like to, uh, I think we're at... Only one minute. I want to... Ali, this is for you. Don't be uh, afraid about the change of the names took internationally as another name, a third name. If you just look on the brochure of the mega cruiser coming here, there is a the, the official name, ask a car driver how they call the souk. And you, you see, the souk is souk shisha. That's it. <laughs> so it is, it, is it is written on the brochure of the mega cruise liner MSC. When you ask, go ask about Suk Shisha, that's it. Sorry for this. That's okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. And I would like to um, thank all our speakers. So please join me in that to thank them, please. And um, we're having a we're having a 15-minute coffee break. So please join us back at four for the next session. Thank you very much.